Hey, Pool Chasers. On today's episode, we are talking about two alternative sanitizer solutions you can use during this challenging season as our industry continues to navigate through the chlorine tab shortage. Can you guess which two? <laughs> yep, we're talking about salt and UV systems. Both offer a great alternative, but just like everything else in our industry, you will want to educate yourself on how to maintain a pool properly when using these products. Our guests today do a great job of explaining how salt systems work, when and how to clean a salt cell, why calcium flakes happen, and how they are intended to be used with automation. As far as UV goes, they explain how it works exactly, the proper way to maintain and handle the bulbs, how it can be used to eliminate chloramines, and how it is not only a growing trend in our industry, but one that is being heavily utilized all over the world. So, please enjoy episode 131 with John Rotundo and John Watt of Pentair. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. All right, well, thank you both for joining us today. Can you please introduce yourselves and what your role at Pentair is? Yeah, thanks. I'll start. Uh, my name is John Rotundo. I'm the group product manager for cleaners and sanitizers at Pentair. Been with the company a little bit over five years, been in the industry a little bit over 10 years. And before the pool industry, I used to work in the small appliances, consumer goods, work for uh, a company called Jarden, and we used to develop and sell um, small appliances to the big box target and Costco and in Walmart. And I've been in, in the pool industry for 10 years and, and it's been a great ride. Um, it's a very interesting um, industry uh, and very profitable, if everybody knows, and, 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 and really good time. I'm John Watt. I've been with Pentair for, this will be my 27th year. I've held just about every role at my level that I can hold uh, from the first commercial field service tech to service manager to national and international trainer. I was a product development specialist, uh, applications engineering, and new product development uh, has been part of my role here lately, as well as I've taken over commercial sales for Arizona and Southern Nevada. Prior to coming to Pentair, I was an electrical troubleshooter for General Motors. And prior to that, I was a recovery and demolition diver for the Army. Wow. Very cool. Well, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Thank you. So let's talk about this tab shortage a little bit. Everybody knows it's kind of going on. From your side of things, what are you projecting will happen over the kind of next few years with the way pools are being sanitized? You know, first of all, I know it's it's unfortunate that this happened um, due to a natural disaster. But the good news is that there's other solutions out there that effectively sanitize your pool. Um, we have um, a couple that we want to talk about. The first uh, are the salt cells. We have IntelliClor and iClor, and these products create chlorine in a very safe way using electrolysis when we combine the water, salt water, with the electric charge blades inside of the salt cell. So, you know, there's, I hear in my years of, of tenure here with Pentair, a lot of consumers, not in the trade so much, but consumers saying, well, I do have a salt pool and my pool has no chlorine. And, and I think there's a misconception of, of what a salt pool is. But uh, what people don't realize is it's, you know, the salt cell, it's a automated way of generating chlorine um, with, with salt. So those are very effective. Those are very great products for chlorinating your pool. And the good thing is they're automated, right? So it's not, you take the guessing out of the process. You don't have to go and you know spend your weekends um, pouring chlorine or, or feeding the tabs, these are set it and forget it type of um, application. In terms of what we see in the next couple of years because of the shortage, I think is yet to be seen. I mean, I know that for 2021, absolutely there's going to be a shortage. I believe the first six to eight months, there's going to be a spike on sales for salt salt cells especially, and then other types of like UV and ozone. The good news is we also have UV um, BioShield as a sanitizer, and we do have ozone as well um, through our company Pinter under the brand today of Clearwater. So we do have all three different types of sanitation that allows 
this shortage to get the trade and, and people with the right tools to sanitize their pool. Now, Tyler, there's another aspect of this shortage that kind of prepared us for the tab shortage. Uh, as of January of last year, the Southern Nevada Health District started cracking down on cyanuric acid levels in semi-commercial and commercial pools. Mm -hmm. And I did an experiment on my pool this, this past summer, and I found that through the use of tabs, my cyanuric acid level went up dramatically. In my case, it went up beyond what was an acceptable level. So there's been some shift away from tabs to some degree in the commercial market just because of that stabilizer issue. So they're looking into other means of sanitization. They're using uh, chemical controllers that have the capacity to inject liquid chlorine and muriatic acid or perhaps CO2, things like that. So a small sense, I think we were already beginning to prepare for, on the commercial side, a retraction from tabs. I know they're easy and, uh, you know, they provide a good sanitization level for a pool, but they were looking at that cyanuric acid level issue and starting to steer away slightly. Right. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of debate with the CYA over the last probably two years, like you said, and mostly in commercial. And, but now it's kind of moving to residential and now we're being forced to. So I agree. I think that we were already moving in that direction, but this is going to push everybody a little bit quicker to that. So let's talk about the salt systems then. Can you explain kind of how the salt cell works and then kind of what the benefits are switching to a salt pool? There's a few benefits. To me, the biggest benefit is the ability to automate the production and dispensing of chlorine. Like I said before, this is a set it and forget it type of application and, and, and it's very safe. Again, this is uh, it's done through an electrolysis process where salt water goes through a number of blades inside of, of the cell, which the blades are electric charged, and it works really like a car battery. And this electrolysis, it's a reaction, it's a chemical reaction where now the it creates chlorine in a form of little bubbles and gas. So it dispenses that chlorine through to the pool, and it does it in, like I said, in a very automated way. So when we combine IClor with a controller, in this case, we have the IntelliChem, we now can monitor the water for pH and ORP. And then the salt system can be set up to ensure that chlorine is produced to keep that ORP to the right levels. So it's not, there's, there's not going to be a lot of checking your pool for those levels because now the IntelliChem does that job for you. It really tells you, you know, what level, it constant monitors the levels and you set up the, the IntelliClor or iClor to dispense to make sure that those levels are maintained throughout the, the weeks and months of using that pool. And then some other benefits, the second benefit to me is it's, it really saves time with chlorine and tabs and liquid and, and all of that, unless you have a pool service, which now comes every, every week to your house and, and takes care of that chlorine input to the pool. It's really a lot of guessing, right? And a lot of checking, a lot of monitoring the water manually, and then, or taking it to your local dealer in a weekly basis, and then have to react to a condition of, of the water. Here with a system, you have IntelliChem, you have iClor and, and IntelliClor, um, these products will do that for you. And also, if you are a service or a dealer that you have different pools in your route, this allows you to save time because now you know that having those product products in your pool allows for them to be more efficient and faster on their routes than having a chlorine or liquid chlorine or other forms of chlorination for the pool. Tyler, one of the other things that, you know, as service professionals and manufacturers and so on, we overlook, and it's actually one of the most common responses we get from homeowners who have a salt system on their pool. They claim that when they get in and out of the water, they have a different feel. The water, their hair is softer. Their skin doesn't feel so dry if there's salt in that water. Um, and if you think about it like this, it makes perfect sense. If you have a swimming pool and there's no calcium in the water, the water will actually pull the calcium from the plaster in the pool, right? Right. Well, if you've got salt in that water, um, one tear, one human tear has about 7,200 parts per million salt. If you get into a swimming pool that has no salt in it, the water actually wicks the salt out of your skin. 
So when you get out, your skin feels dry, your hair feels crispy and so on. So one of the other benefits, and like I said, the uh, more common response we would get from a homeowner would not be the the uh, maintenance and so on. It would be, I was in a salt pool this weekend and I got out and my skin and my hair felt fantastic. It's so much different. Um, so it, it takes on a completely different perspective from the homeowner's point of view. Yeah, and I think from a pool service point of view, you know, it's less chlorine that you're having to lug in the backyard. You know, it's, you know, not the safest to just barehanded, you know, pick up a chlorine tablet and put it into a floater or even just carrying those four by cases of liquid chlorine into a backyard. You know, sometimes you've got a pretty long walk from your <laughs> yeah. uh, maintenance truck to the pool. So even just having to bring less liquid chlorine on a salt pool or something like that helps out tremendously. Some of our guys here in the Valley and other states are realizing, and they're just getting cracked down on this, is that they have to have special permits and licenses to carry, you know, quantities of chlorine and muriatic acid on their vehicles. And uh, the states are starting to crack down on that due to incidents that happen on the road and so on. So um, it, the expense of hauling that material around with you all the time is getting worse and worse. And with this tab shortage, I'm a Facebook guy, and I belong to a couple of the organizations for the pool guys here in my area. And people are actually stealing the tabs out of the back of the trucks because they can't get them anywhere. Yeah, it's been pretty rough <clears throat> to watch people talk about that. Ben there, we, we got jacked before the pandemic. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we were cleaning a pool. I was training somebody cleaning a pool and came back and everything was gone. Thankfully, the homeowner had cameras on the front of the house that captured the whole thing. Yeah, Pretty that's crazy. That's, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. One other thing that I wanted to mention is the blades for our salt cells are, are designed and manufactured to last 8,000 hours. So if you do the math, uh, depending on your region and depending on the state, salt cells will last over two or two years depending on the usage. You know, there is a little bit of maintenance that you have to do to the salt cells, but it's really not an everyday task. So it's very easy, time-saving, and the time has come to replace your cell, which is over two years. It's a very easy replacement um, process as well. Yeah, so tell us about the two different types of cells you guys have, the IntelliClor and the iClor. What's the difference between the two? So the Intellic Chlor, it's definitely our best-selling product. We sell it a couple ways. We sell it as in individual cells, and these are replacements to already a system that has cells, so Intellic Chlors. You can buy them to replace your, your original cell. We sell it as a bundle with, um, with um, the, power, the power center, what we call the PC100. And also, we do bundle it with our automation system. So you know, um, our builders love to um, set up these salt cells. And so what we offer, um, it's a it's a way of, of buying the automation with that comes with the IntelliClor already into the bundle. Uh, this IntelliClor has a two year warranty and it's sold both in brick and mortar and um, eat retailers online. Um, and then it really has, from a control side, it has a panel with the ability to control the chlorine output levels in increments of 20. It also indicates, you know, your salt level uh, with a light, as well as the output level with, with some other light. So very easily, you can walk to your pad and see your salt level, your output level, and get a sense of, of how your chlorine production is doing. And of course, if, if you have automation or you have the IntelliCam, now you, you will also have the ability to understand where your ORP and your pH levels are. The iClor is pretty much from a principle and how it works is, is exactly the same. Now, it's, it's a little bit different uh, instead of being a, a long rectangular blade. This is a, it's, it's more of a round, but it's installed the same way through the pipe. In the differences, the iClor has two additional features. One is a smart sense flow detection, and this allows the connection to an IntelliFlow variable speed pump. How it works is it connects through an RS-485 communication cable from the pump to our power center. And it really, what it does is 
it communicates with the cell and it lets the cell know that the pump is working. And once the pump is working, then it, it activates for chlorine production. If the pump has either two things, it's shut down or has too low flow, then the chlorine production will stop. And this is, you know, a nice feature to have because it really works only when there's the flow is correct and also the pump it's it's really working. And then the second feature is the smart sense cover and it connects the same way if you have a pool cover and it's an automatic pool cover, you can connect from that cover to the to the PC100 to the power center and what this does is allow a signal to reduce the chlorine output when the cover is closed. Before, we heard a lot of issues when pool covers were completely closed and the chlorinator and the salt cell was producing chlorine. It can produce and, and get a lot of buildup, not only from fluorine in the water, but a lot of gas in between the, the surface of the pool water and in the cover. So this allows to reduce that chlorine uh, production. It still sanitizes the water, but it does. It solves that problem of, of overproducing in gas production and, and when the cover is closed. The other difference is the iClor, it's a trade grade product. And what this means, it can only be sold in the brick and mortar dealers. It's not sold online. So we protect our dealers by having this product sold to them exclusively through a brick and mortar setting. It has three years warranty, so a little different. The IntelliClor has two years warranty, and this iClor has three year warranty. And then the last feature or difference I want to talk about it's a control panel. The IntelliClor has indicator lights, which tells you levels and salt levels and output. The iClor has a screen display that has a little bit more features in terms of how you can diagnose of what's happening with a, with, with a salt cell. So there's a number of ways to checking, you know, the salt level, the output level, the usage of the cell and other features through a display that it resides into the control panel of the i nice. uh, Tyler, um, one of the things that John didn't cover is the fact that we make the uh, IntelliClor for uh, residential, but we also have separate IntelliClor systems for commercial. Typically, if you're going to build a commercial salt system, you're looking at two pounds of chlorine production per day for every 10,000 gallons. And we have commercial systems that are designed to connect to chemical controllers, not just our IntelliChem, but other manufacturers, so that we can build and size a system properly for pools upwards of 100,000 gallons plus. So it's a little bit different setup where you have a master that, that runs everything, one cell that con is in control, and then a series of slave cells. But we do have the capacity to handle the, some of the largest commercial pools, uh, some of the smaller HMAC pools that perhaps have a greater requirement for chlorine than your typical residential pool. Oh, yeah, it's really cool. I've seen those setups on some pictures. They're pretty crazy looking with all the slave cells, but that's awesome that you have the ability to do that. Pentair is adding technology to help ease the experience of owning a pool. Take control of your pools with their all-new automation control panel, IntelliSync, and the Pentair Home app. With the IntelliSync, you will get affordable automation, 24-7 pump control by monitoring via the Pentair Home app, easy installation, which will actually allow you to plug directly into a 120-volt outlet, freeze protection, which helps safeguard the pump in cold weather conditions, and you will receive maintenance alerts to stay ahead of any issues. This can all be done through the Pentair Home app, which allows the ability to command all of a home's water systems at any time. It gives your customers peace of mind by giving them instant status information and monitoring from home or away 24-7. It notifies them when equipment needs attention, and it has the ability to connect them with a trusted professional like you. Stay smart, connected, and protected with Pentair. Learn more about the IntelliSync and the Pentair Home app at Pentair.com or click the link below. And with both of these having the capability of integrating with automation, what exactly does that look like either through the automation board and to the phone application? What exactly does that all look like for a salt cell? Essentially, what it's going to give you is uh, through the automation, it's going to give you your ORP and just a little brief segment on ORP. A lot of guys know that it's oxidation reduction potential. 
But to break it down into layman's terms, um, let's say you're a football coach, okay, and you get a 300 pound lineman that comes into your office and he's you know six eight and he's four percent body fat and just just big as a beast. Do you want him on your team? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. You want them on your team. Okay. Well, the actual uh, chlorine level in your pool is the physical appearance of that individual that came into your office. Okay. The ORP is the activity level. I like to refer to it as the scouting report. Okay. You just found out that this linebacker is disruptive to his team. He's got three blown discs in his lower back and he just had an incident with his girlfriend. That's going to make public news. Do you still want him on your team? Yes. <laughs> well, isn't that, yeah, isn't, that pretty, isn't that pretty common <laughs> obviously obviously a patriots fan on the, on the oh no, no no <laughs> no bucks fan <laughs> but uh so that makes it tougher though your, oh, to answer your question yes that's that makes a decision much tougher <laughs> yeah so if you look at orp like the scouting report you know if you may have chlorine in there but what's it actually doing the ORP is going to give you the best indication of the potential for that chlorine to do its job in the pool. Um, we've all had it where we've had pools that were, you know, perhaps even four or 5.0 chlorine level, but it's still turning green. Well, the, the chlorine may be in there, but it may be inactive. The ORP is the activity level of that chlorine. So one of the things you get when you uh, go with chemical automation, like an IntelliChem, or you tie it to uh, the IntelliChem to automation, is you get access to a readout that shows you what the actual ORP is on that body of water. The other ones are your temperature, which is also a factor in, in your water chemistry, as well as your pH. The one that it doesn't give you, and I'm not aware of a system that, that gives you this right now, but is your alkalinity. And anytime you're dealing with chemical automation, whether it's salt cells or liquid injection or so on, your alkalinity is obviously the key. But it does give you direct access. If you're on vacation, you can see if your pool of water is, you know, you're going to come home to a swamp or you're going to come home to a clear pool. It gives you that level of indication, which is helpful. It's a peace of mind. The other thing when you tie it to uh, automation is uh, if you have the chemical controller, it'll tell you when you're running low on your chlorine or low on your acid. It'll also tell you if you've got a salt system on there that you have a salt cell that's working properly or you have a salt cell that needs to be cleaned or you've lost communication. It gives you those indications when you tie it to automation. Very good. Thank you. So we've seen salt cells installed at a lot of different ways on the equipment pads, but what do you guys recommend in terms of either you're approaching an, equi an existing equipment pad that already has everything plumbed in and you're gonna add a new salt cell or one from the very beginning, you know, brand new, how do you recommend the salt cells being installed? Always when you're gonna inject chemicals to the pool, whether it's chlorine or acid or whatever, you want that to be the last piece in the line. You don't want to expose the rest of your equipment set to those the uh, chemicals that you're injecting because it may be a small amount of chemical doesn't, you know, it the factor is that you're adding that small amount of chemical to a small amount of water as opposed to pouring it into the pool itself. So the concentration of the uh, chemical in the water is going to be high until it's distributed to the pool. So typically what I will tell people is the uh, the salt cell is the last thing in line. And if you're going to feed acid to that pool through a chemical automation system, feed the acid prior to the cell. And the advantage there is the uh, ruthenium plates that are in the cell are impervious to the muriatic acid. But what does help is as that acid passes through in that higher concentration, it'll help break down the calcium that has a tendency to build up on those plates. And you won't have to clean the cell as frequently. So uh, like I said, as a general rule, last thing in line. If you've got a heater after the heater, um, you know, uh, obviously you want to keep that kind of stuff away from anything that's more susceptible to water chemistry issues. And that would be, um, you know, your, anything copper, your pump seals and so on. Never try and pull this, uh, the, put the salt cell before a pump or uh, before the filter, especially before the filter, because you want to filter out all of the debris so that you're not plugging the cell up with leaves and whatever else is in the pool. Right. And for any rookie pool professionals out there, maybe not quite a professional yet, but you do need to have the equipment running in order for the salt cell to work. Is that correct? That's a great point. I get that call in the springtime. People call my salt cells not working. You know, it's supposed to maintain this level. And my first question is how many hours a day are you running it? When you rate a salt cell, uh, our IC60 is rated for two pounds of chlorine in a 24 hour period. So when you rate it, it's considered the, the maximum rating is for a 24 hour a day operation. If you're running it four hours a day, you're only getting a fraction of, of that chlorine production 
due to the limited time that you're running the pump. So uh, yes, absolutely. The amount of time a pump runs each day will have an impact on the amount of coin that that cell can generate. Yeah, and also, I, I mean, I didn't see it much here in Arizona for a long time, but if the water gets too cold, it'll start stop producing too, right? Well, there's a reason for that. That's a great, great comment. The reason why the uh, cell shuts down in cold water is the warmer water gets, the greater its ability to conduct electricity. Okay, and I'm from the Northeast, and uh, in the wintertime when it's cold and dry, you walk across the carpet, and then you touch a light switch, and you're going to get lit up before the light does. Okay, (laughs) that's static (laughs) discharge. Well, if you don't have enough conductivity in the water, the power that's traveling from your cathode to your anode and back, that, that power, that current passes through the water. If you don't have enough conductivity in the water, then rather than flow evenly between the plates, it'll build up an arc. And it causes pocking to the ruthenium coating on the blades, and it can actually shorten the life of that cell. So the reason Mm. for the shutdown is the uh, water has lost some of its conductivity, and it's going to shorten the life of the cell. And let's face it, guys, when that water gets down to 45, 50 degrees, 55 degrees, you're not swimming in that pool anyway. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So there's really no organic bather load to battle. I mean, maybe your dogs are going in there. But the nice thing about that is if you've got a UV system on there and your dogs are swimming in the pool, but you're not, the UV system will take care of the bacteria and pathogens that may be carried in by the dog. You know, it's, it's still a safe environment. Right. And speaking of dogs, how often should the salt cell be cleaned and what are some of the best practices for that? The salt cell needs to be clean when it indicates that it needs to be clean, or if you see a drop-off in chlorine production. If it's out struggling to keep up, our salt systems have indicator lights that it'll basically tell you to either clean the cell or check your salt level. If your cell's not producing and your salt level is up to a par, then obviously you, you look at that cell to be cleaned. But the better you maintain your water chemistry, the more likely it is you'll have, you won't have as frequent cleaning of that cell. And here's how it works. When you generate chlorine from a salt system, it generates that chlorine at a high pH, okay? When your pH goes up and you get the warm water, the calcium falls out of solution very rapidly. What happens is that water warms up as it passes through the cell because of the electric current passing through it, and the calcium tends to stick to the plates or or build up on those plates. We have a cathode and an anode in that system where one is a high pH, one is a low pH and they reverse cycle. So for a while, for a couple of hours, it'll run with the current running in one direction than the other. And that helps take off some of that scaling from the plates. And I'm sure you've all seen it middle of the summer, water's 90 degrees and you start to get what looks like snowflakes at the returns. Well, that's a result of the polarity changing back and forth on those plates, but you're getting enough of a calcium buildup on those plates where it's flaking off instead of just dissolving. That tells you that you're just on the fringe of calcifying a cell. So if you keep your alkalinity and your pH in check, then you'll get less scale buildup on those plates. And I've had salt cells on my pool that have gone a year without having to be cleaned. I've got others that I've seen out there that can barely go a week because they scale up so quickly right. and it has a, it, it has everything to do with your water chemistry and maintaining the balance. Yeah. And we typically told our technicians to check them about every three months here in Arizona. If you balance the water, just clean them about every three months seem to work pretty well for us here. Yeah. And right. what exactly is the process when it comes to cleaning a salt cell? Does it usually come with a stand and how are you going about that? There's one way to do it, and there's a couple of methods to make that happen. The way to clean a salt cell is with a combination of muriatic acid and water. I typically will tell someone four to one, four parts water, one part acid. And what you'll do is you'll, you'll plug one into the cell. We have uh, a cleaning stand that you can purchase that you can use for cleaning that cell. If you're in a pinch or you don't have a cleaning stand, I like to use a racquetball. And I'll pop it in the end of the cell that doesn't have the flow switch. And then I'll put that cell in my five-gallon bucket. And I will pour the acid and water mixture into the cell. Do not pour the acid and water into the bucket and submerge the cell because you're, uh, you know, if there's any chance of water seeping into the electrical side of that, um, you'll ruin the cell. But I'll stand it upright in my bucket. I'll pour the acid and water into the cell. And what you'll notice when you pour that acid and water combination in there is it starts to boil. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention before you do this, uh, power down your pump and power down your uh, salt system. I typically will power down everything on the system. The last thing you want when you've got that cell removed from the system is the pump to come on and you've got this, you know, 10 inch open section of pipe where water's gonna be spraying everywhere. And trust me, when you go out to the truck to get a tool, that's when that pump's gonna kick on. 
and it's going to yeah. run until you get back into the backyard. But uh, back to the cleaning process, the five gallon bucket will keep any acid and water that you're poured into the cell. Any of it that spills, it'll keep it from spilling onto the deck or the ground, uh, causing potential damage to the equipment pad or to the pavers or whatever they've got out there. You let it boil until the boiling stops. You know, a lot of times you can just pour that acid and water back into the pool. Chances are if you scale the cell, then your uh, pH is high anyway. And if you've got any minor debris in there at that point, once you've boiled it out, you can use a garden hose with, uh, you know, typically your thumb over the end of the hose to create the pressure and just spray the rest of the calcium that didn't come off with the acid. I never recommend you putting anything down inside that cell. The ruthenium coating on those blades um, has everything to do with the life of that cell. If you take a stick, or I've seen guys use hacksaw blades, uh, zip ties, and try and poke stuff out from between those cells, that calcium is aggressive. It is a, uh, you know, use it in making sandpaper. You can damage those blades. So don't ever stick anything down inside there. Boil it with acid and rinse it with the hose, and you should be good to go. Right. Thank you very much. And definitely... Uh, we've cleaned a ton of salt cells. Make sure that you're wearing a respirator and glasses because mm -hmm. when you're pouring that muriatic acid in, it's not going into the water, which absorbs the acid. When you're pouring it into uh, the actual cell, those fumes are just coming straight back up. So right. you want to make sure because you will choke real quick, you know, for anybody <laughs> that hasn't done it before. Yeah. John, anything else to add on the salt stuff? I mean, the only thing that I want to um, mention is that, you know, sizing it's 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 definitely uh, something important to take into consideration when buying a cell. Uh, we do have different cells for the different sizing. We 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 have it in in gallons. So we do have you know fifteen thousand gallons, twenty thousand gallons, forty thousand gallons, and sixty thousand gallons. So depending on the on the size of your pool, make sure that you size it correctly because all it is is the output and the production but you want to make sure that you have the right cell for, for the right size. Yeah. And we typically try to go a little bit higher sometimes just so you can run it a lower number percentage wise so that you're not, the cell will last a little bit longer that way. It will. It will for sure. And I have a, a couple more questions when it comes to the, the salt pools. Do you have any recommendations when adding salt to the pool? I mean, are you adding, you know, however many bags of salt to the pool and then, brushing it into solution, leaving the, the pool on? What what do you recommend when adding, you know, salt to the pool for the first time? Uh, well, when you're adding salt to the first time, for the first time to that pool, the first thing I recommend is to do a salt check on that pool. There's a high potential for getting salt in with your fill water. Right. And then adding too much salt to the pool from that point forward. In the uh, owner's manual for the salt systems, it'll ask you how many gallons of water you've got, and it'll tell you how many pounds of salt you need to uh, bring it up to the proper level of 29 to 3,900 parts per million. So there is a guideline there. I would add the minimum and then uh, brush it. Obviously, you don't want it'll sit on the bottom of the pool. You don't ever want anything sitting on the surface of your pool. So I would brush it towards the drains. I would brush it to into solution as much as you can while you're there. And um, then I come back the next day. And if it needs more, then you can add more. The only way to get the salt out of the pool is to either carry it out with bather load or pump it out. And um, here in Arizona, when the temperatures get over 100 degrees, the last thing you want to be doing is draining a pool down to uh, expose the interior surface to the sun and heat that's that's present. So um, that's that's the general rule as far as uh, adding your salt to your pool. Uh, one of the things that you will notice with a salt system is um, in the winter months, you may get down to 2,900 or less, or say you can even show that you need to add salt. That has to do with the conductivity of the water and the temperature getting colder on that body of water. And let's say you've got 2,900 in um, March, you may have, you know, 3,500 or 3,900 in July or August when the water temperature comes up and still have the same amount of salt in that water. One of the ways that we use to measure the salt content in the water is conductivity. So just kind of keep that in mind. You are going to see some fluctuation. And if in the event you see a high salt light, uh, my pool got up to 95 degrees this year and I got a high salt light. It's just telling you that you've got more salt in that water than you need. It's not going to affect the performance of the salt cell as far as its output or its ability to sanitize that water. It's just telling you, you got a little too much in there. You may want to consider when the weather's right, taking some of that water out. Yeah. And are people going to run into any issues if you are in the summertime adding chlorine tabs 
and different things like that to the pool. Does that have any effect on a salt pool with a salt cell? It doesn't have any effect on a salt pool with a salt cell. It does have a major effect if you're controlling that salt system with a chemical controller that turns the salt cell on and off based on ORP. If you've got an ORP set for 700 and you've got a, uh, a chemical controller turning the salt cell on and off, um, your ORP nev may never reach 700 if your cyanuric acid levels are high. So every tab you add to that pool is going to add some stabilizer to that pool as well. And eventually your stabilizer level is going to get to a point where you can't reach that 700 ORP. So it's going to turn the cell on. You're going to see 5.0 and plus on your uh, chlorine levels, but your ORP is never going to come up. You're never going to see that activity level. So basically your, your cyanuric acid at that point, and I like, I'm a, I'm a reference guy. I'm a, a welder. If I go outside today and it's bright and sunny and I don't have glasses on, I squint. Okay. I put my sunglasses on and it's perfect. I can see I'm not squinting. It's a good day. I put my welding goggles on and I start bumping into things. Cyanuric acid is the same way. If you don't have enough in the pool, then your chlorine is going to flash and go away. If you have the right amount, life is good. If you have too much, then you're going to protect that chlorine so so well with that cyanuric acid that it really can't do its job. Hmm. So um, with adding tabs to a salt pool without a chemical controller, you're okay. Adding tabs to a pool with a chemical controller on it that monitors pH and ORP, you will eventually run into problems maintaining that pool due to a high cyanuric acid level. Very nice. Good answer. Thank you. Hey, pool chasers. Are you looking to invest in your business after a big summer? Well, if you've been thinking about adding leak detection as a service offering, now is the time to get connected with Anderson Manufacturing to find the equipment and resources you need to get started. Anderson is a source leak pros trust because of their honest advice and tools that get the job done right. This year, to better connect with you during an uncertain trade show season, they are offering one-on-one -on -one video conferences to bring the show experience to you. Schedule a time now to learn about leak detection opportunities, see live product demonstrations, and put together an equipment package to fit your needs. They even have show specials that are available for a limited time. To learn more and sign up for a meeting, visit leaktools.com slash show. That's leaktools.com slash show, or click the link below. So let's move on from salt to UV. Can you please tell us what the benefit is of UV and why it's something that the listeners should get educated on? UV is, is really one of the few non-intrusive ways of sanitation. There's nothing like it. It's instead of introducing something to the water, like every sanitation uh, solution out there. So chlorine, you, you introduce chemicals to the water. Same with muriatic acid. Same with, with other types of, of um, sanitation. This UV, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a cylinder that contains a UV light, which then sanitizes the water by exposing that water that got, comes through that light to the UV light. So the water is actually going into a chamber with a light, and it's completely non-intrusive. You're not adding anything to the water. That, to me, is one of the biggest benefits of, of UV and our product BioShield. And this technology has been proven in other applications, not only in commercial, um, but also if you go to your dentist, dentists use uh, UV lights to disinfect their tools. So it works in the water and it's a great water treatment solution. Now, the UV lamp generates UVC light. And how effective is that UVC light? Well, that light doesn't really kill anything. So just we have to understand that it's not, we're not killing um, bacteria. But what we're doing is sterilizing the bacteria and pathogens so they can't reproduce. And if they can't reproduce, then eventually they'll be taken by the filter and you'll be with, with less bacteria each time the water goes through that chamber and that light. It also, uh, one other benefit of the UV system, it also helps with algae control. And, and because of this, being non-intrusive, sterilizing the bacteria and also helping with your algae control, it's really not a primary way of sanitation. You're still gonna need chlorine in your water, but it's definitely an enhancement to the sanitation um, process. So if you have a salt cell system and you have a UV system, now you're doubling down in your sanitization. Your chlorine is oxidizing the pool 
And then once you pass that water through the UV system, now you're sterilizing the water. So you're doing a double effect here and, you know, a double sanitization interaction between the two products. So we recommend every time we go out and then and tell people to use a chlorinator, we recommend to use a UV system because not only it, it doubles down on the sanitation process, but also once you do the UV, it requires less chlorine in the water because it's actually working twice as hard. So your salt system will last longer. Um, and you don't need to, to have an output of, of chlorine as high as you would if you don't have a UV system. So it definitely enhances the sanitation process of maintaining your pool. Okay, uh, Tyler, I want to go a little deeper into what John just said, but I want to touch on something else. And uh, this one's kind of near and dear to me being in Arizona. Okay, chloramines are the byproduct of your sanitization. Right. Um, and basically what we're looking at here, and, and I've done some work with uh, NSF and some other uh, bodies to, uh, to investigate this. Chloramines are slowly becoming the secondhand smoke that we dealt with on airplanes and in offices and, and so on. The chloramines, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a professional swimmer or a uh, coll collegiate athlete or even a high school athlete that is a swimmer that doesn't have some type of adverse effect from the chloramines. And um, it's swimmer's lung, lifeguard cough, uh, asthma, uh, things like that. So UV does is aside from sanitizing, it breaks the molecular bond of the monochloramines causing them to fall apart. And then they're irradiated out of the water by the lamp itself. So the one of the bigger effects that you have here as far as the effect on your pool is to get rid of the chloramines. Uh, are you guys dog owners? Yes, Any of you? I have one little dog. All right. When your dog goes in the swimming pool and you go in the pool the next day, can you smell dog on the water? No. Okay, well that's good. A lot of people <laughs> experience that. My, my in-laws have a golden retriever rescue here in town. And they bring their dogs over and they swim in the pool and my dogs get in the pool and you smell the smell of the dog on the surface of the water. It just smells like wet dog. And uh, the UV breaks down the chloramines that are created by the dog swimming in your pool. So one cycle through the system and you can't tell the dogs were ever in there. So chloramines are an issue. And, and like I said, the, uh, the BioShield system that we sell for residential and the HMAC industry, we went to NSF and, and we've got a new category created with NSF called water conditioning device. And the main goal of a water conditioning device is to get rid of the chloramines. Chloramines build up on the surface of water, uh, right from the surface up to six to eight inches above the surface. Being a towering 5'5", five five, that's where I'm breathing. Um, I'm not tall enough to get too much further out of the water, even in my play pool. So um, I'm breathing those chloramines in and they are having a hazardous effect. Uh, indoor pools, uh, you get people complain that, that the pool smells like chlorine. That's typically your chloramines. With the um, certification that we got through NSF for this water conditioning device, we've managed to remove the majority of the chloramines from the water. And you don't get that chloramine smell. Uh, have you ever been to a hotel where you don't even have to ask if they have a pool? You can smell it from the front desk. Yep. Uh, situations like that where UV is a major benefit to the system. One of the uh, Northern California uh, health inspectors, uh, even before we were certified, allowed a UV system to be installed on one of the uh, HMAC pools there because they were getting weekly complaints of the chlorine smell. He looked the other way because the, um, the problem went away when the UV was installed. Now, as far as the sanitization properties, we're seeing UV used on the subways in New York City and in Boston. We're seeing Boeing using it in their restrooms and other major airlines using UV wands over the seats and trays and everything. Uh, UV has a very positive effect on sanitization. And what it does is, is uh, this. We give an example that we're exposed to billions of bacteria and pathogens every day, okay? When do we get sick from those bacteria and pathogens? It's when they get in your body and they're allowed to reproduce. What UV does to those bacteria and pathogens is it disrupts the DNA so they cannot reproduce. We're still exposed to them. They're still there. But because they get into your system and they can't reproduce, they can't make us sick. Hmm. The other nice thing is benefits of the chloramines being uh, eliminated by the UV system. The need for shocking a pool is also reduced or eliminated completely. 
And I'll touch once again on what John said. We're not adding anything to the water. With ozone, you've got ozone that you're sending through the system, and it gas whatever's left is gassed off at the surface of the pool on most residential systems. Commercial systems, they have big contact chambers with flapper valves on the top, and it goes off through a catalyst that burns the ozone off before it goes into the atmosphere. They go through all those processes to, uh, to clean up that ozone, where, like I said, on the residential side, the bubbles just come to the surface and it gases off. With the UV, there's no off-gassing. It's a UVC light that shines through the water and gets rid of your chloramines and sanitizes that water. Yeah, and one, one of the things also about chloramines is it, it can also contribute to the corrosion. So if you have your pad very close of the, to the pool, it, it can help to corrode some of the metals around the pad and some of the equipment. So taking those chloramines out, not only it's beneficial for the health of the pool user, but also it helps with corrosion problems. Well, thank you for that explanation. Where do you recommend installing the BioShield on the equipment pad? The BioShield can be installed anywhere after the filter. There's a, a term called UVT, and that's UV transmittance. That's the ability of the UV light to pass through the water. It has to pass through the water in order to sanitize it. Okay. If you put the UV system after the filter, then the smaller particulate is trapped by the filter and you're getting a much cleaner water through that cell. What that does is allow UV light or UVT to be at a higher level to uh, complete the sanitization process. With a UV system, it's like a tanning bed. Okay. The longer you stay in the tanning bed, the more tan you get. Well, UV systems are the same way. We vary the intensity on, with the size of the UV system, and we vary the length of time that the water is allowed to stay in front of the lamp. Thus, we have a 45, a 62, and a 100 GPM unit. Each one of them is a little taller than the smaller one, which allows the water to stay in front of the lamp longer. And each one has a little bit higher output lamp, and that's what gives us our ability to sanitize that water. Right. Thank you. And what type of maintenance needs to be done on the BioShield? And, you know, how often does that lamp need to be replaced? Um, I recommend checking the system once every six months. Uh, to check the system is very simple. You cut power off to everything on the equipment pad, and then you can slide the uh, lamp and quartz sleeve, sleeve assembly out of the UV system. You can check it for leaks, make sure there's no water inside the quartz sleeve. You can check for any buildup on the outside of the quartz sleeve as far as calcium or you know, anything that might have been uh, coating on that lamp or that, that quartz sleeve, excuse me. Um, at 12,000 hours, the lamp drops below 80% output. At that point, it's time to change that lamp in order to maintain the uh, level of sanitization that was prescribed. Uh, typically for a residential pool, you're gonna see 30 millijoules of UV to sanitize that body of water. For a uh, commercial pool, you're gonna see 40 millijoules for an outdoor pool. For indoor pools and spas, you're gonna you're prescribed 60 millijoules of sanitization through the UV system. So there is sizing and it affects what type of body of water that it is. Like I said, residential, commercial outdoor, commercial indoor, and spas. And that's 30 millijoules, 40 millijoules, and 60 millijoules. Are there indicators on the bulb or something that lets you know it's ran for more than 12,000 hours? There's no timer or indicator. Some manufacturers do have them, but you know, through electrical outages and so on, we found them to be somewhat less than reliable. Typically, what I'll have them do is mark the unit itself or mark you know, on their um, chemical logs the date that a lamp was installed and then go ahead in their calendar to mark the date that it should be changed out. The nice thing is, is um, we don't treat this like uh, razor blades. We sell the UV unit and the lamps are very inexpensive to replace. Upon replacing that UV lamp, I highly recommend that you replace all the seals and gaskets that seal that quartz sleeve so that it ensures that you don't get any water back down in the system. When you reassemble it, before you put the lamp in the quartz sleeve, turn the pump on, let it run for a few minutes, and with a paper towel down inside the top of the quartz sleeve where the gaskets are to prevent the water from getting in. If after 10 or 15 minutes you don't see any source of uh, water intrusion into the inside of the quartz sleeve, then it's safe to pull that paper towel, put the lamp in, and you're good to go for another six months. So most of the time, especially for pool service companies, you're taking on a new service account that already has a UV system on it, and you don't really know when it was installed. I mean, that was very common for right. us. Yep. So in this scenario, maybe asking the homeowner or looking at 
a, a part number and finding out how old the unit is and if it's over you know so many years would you recommend just going ahead and replacing the bulbs and the gaskets and all those different things you just recommended to simplify the process yes if it's over two years then um i would typically recommend that they change the lamp out the lamps are good for twelve thousand hours but the runtime varies on every system and even if you go out there and the clock is set to run for eight hours a day how many times did they go out there and turn it on manually after a storm and so on mm -hmm. or once a week when the school service or twice a week when the pool service guy goes out there he adds chems he turns the time clock on lets it run you typically can't count on eight hours a day it's going to be more than that on average for the life of that unit two years and uh, new lamp in play and like i said the, the lamps are very inexpensive and simple to change out. It would behoove you to go out there and make that lamp change out. It's going to make maintaining that new project a lot easier. Right. And I don't know, is there any special care instructions with that bulb? I know when you're changing like a normal light bulb, there's certain things that you don't want to touch. Yeah. You, when, anytime you handle the quartz sleeve or the lamp, you're always going to handle that with uh, cotton gloves. Um, and, you know, don't let your fingertips touch it. Treat it like it was a high end lens for a camera. Okay. You know, the acids from your skin can etch the glass, it can etch the quart sleeve, it can uh, shorten the lamp life. So anytime you're handling any of that, you want to make sure that you have cotton gloves on so that none of that oil from your skin is being transferred onto the surface of the sleeve or the lamp itself. As far as lamp disposal, um, Home Depot used to take them. I don't know if they still do on the website for the local government and find out where you can get rid of those or dispose of those UV lamps. I don't recommend that they are disposed in the trash because they do contain mercury vapor. And obviously, we won't, don't want that going into the environment. It's an easy look up online to find out who takes the uh, UV lamps for uh, disposal. All right. Thank you. And if you were to not install one of these bulbs properly, is there any way of knowing that you didn't do it properly? There's really only one way it can be installed. There's a, a, pl a two-pin plug on the lamp, you know, two pins on the lamp, and then there's the uh, white porcelain plug that unplugs from the end of that lamp. It's either plugged in or it's not. I guess the easiest way to tell if you did it right is when you turn it on, there's a uh, viewing port on the top and the bottom of our BioShield systems that allows you to see that the lamp in, has, in fact, come on. But okay. one of the things you want to think about is whether that lamp is on or off over time does not have any indication as to whether or not it's producing the output that it was, was prescribed for that lamp. You get over the 12,000 hours of lamp life on that bulb, the lamp will still come on but it may not have the same output. So don't let that be your indicator as to whether or not a lamp is good. Perfect. And do you recommend using any other form of sanitization with the BioShield? Because you wouldn't just want to use that UV, right? Right. There is no residual. Once again, we say you're not adding anything to the water. You're not. There's no residual with a UV lamp. So um, you will have to maintain a chlorine level in that pool just like you normally would. But once again, with all the properties that the UV lamp is taking on, the amount of chlorine it takes to maintain that level is dramatically reduced. And one of the misconceptions that we have out there is that UV is going to save you 50% uh, of your chlorine usage. In a lot of cases, it is true. And in some cases, it's even more than 50% of your chlorine consumption. But you need to think of it this way. And, and I, I want to be honest about this. If you have a swimming pool that nobody swims in, you have no, no organic bathe load to speak of unless you have a monsoon and so on. So your chlorine depletion on that pool is based on the sun coming out every day and depleting that chlorine. UV is not going to have any effect on the amount of chlorine that the sun actually depletes from your pool. And if you have no organic bather load, you're not going to experience the chlorine reduction. You are going to get all the sanitization effect as far as there's a lot of bacteria and pathogens out there that are resistant to chlorine like Giardia and Cryptosporidium and so on. But the more you use your pool, the more chlorine savings you're going to experience because the bacteria that are added to the pool by human bather load or your pets going in the pool are directly reacted to by the UV system. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, you know, this is an awesome technology. You've seen a lot of use cases of UV. Just recently, I was at a friend's house and had a box in the kitchen um, where you put kids' bottles and different things like that inside mm -hmm. of this little UV box, and it kind of takes away a lot of the bacteria and unwanted things that you want inside your body. So it's really cool to see this technology really you know, come out to the marketplace and be used in many different cases. 
with the increased use of low pressure UV, the cost of the lamps has gone down. So you're seeing it used in more and more technology. And with the awareness, um, you can't go on the news today and not see something about the uh, COVID outbreak and the methods that they're using for sanitization for COVID. And I would say in 90% of the cases, they're using some form of UV. You're exposed to it in your doctor's office, in your dentist's office. They use a UV lamp to sterilize their instruments. Uh, I want you to be aware that there are two types of UV out there that are currently in use. One of them is used in commercial and residential. The other one is predominantly in commercial. And those two categories are low pressure and medium pressure. Okay, low pressure UV creates a wavelength very close to the 254 nanometers it takes to sanitize the water. Medium pressure UV lamps create that 254, but they also have other wavelengths and uh, frequency in that uh, lighting spectrum. They are very powerful and they work very well. Unfortunately, along with the sanitization properties, they do have a um, capacity to deplete your chlorine levels. In other words, they'll burn off your chlorine in the process. They burn very hot and they only burn for 8,000 hours. So the use and adaptation to low pressure UV is key to the UV systems being used in a residential market and the HMAC market and other, uh, other uses. I have a UV lamp for uh, purifying my drinking water when I hike things like that. Keep in mind, there are two different systems, medium pressure and low pressure. And low pressure is really taking command in our industry because of its affordability, the length of time that the lamps last, the ease of serviceability, the general use and other applications. Awesome. Very, very good. And what type of warranty does comes with the BioShield? Yeah. So BioShield comes with a two-year warranty. And from a light perspective, our UV bulb is manufactured and designed to last for 12,000 hours of continuous operation. The warranty of the overall product, it's a two year, it's a trade grade product similar to our trade grade salt cell or, or some other trade grade products, which they all carry a two year warranty. One thing that we didn't mention also with a BioShield, it comes with a flow switch. And this flow switch, what it does is it allows the UV to turn on and off depending on, on the system being in use or not. So that saves a lot of hours of the UV lamp as well, because it only will only turn on when the water it, or the system it's, it's on. Very good. Well, thank you guys so much. This was a ton of very useful information about all these topics. And we just, yeah, we really appreciate you sharing all of this with us and the listeners. Well, you're welcome. I would look forward to being part of one of your uh, presentations since I met you guys at our training seminar. Awesome. It's exciting. Yeah, my pleasure. Hey, Pool Chasers. Thanks for checking out this episode. Did you know that each episode has its own page on our website? This is where you can find more information about the guests and episode topic, as well as all the resources that we discuss throughout the show. To get to the webpage, click the link below. Also below, you will find links to the sponsors of the show, as well as links to follow us on our social media channels. On our channels, you will find some of our favorite clips and bonus material. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our tag is Pool Chasers. We also have a Facebook group for the Pool Chasers community. Here you will find like-minded professionals all looking to make each other better. One last thing, if the episode has brought you value, please check out our Patreon page to support us. And if you could please rate and review the podcast, we would love to hear what your favorite topics are. Thank you for your time and your ear. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.